been about two weeks since I started this little sealed ecosphere, the pond on my windowsill. Let's take a look at what happened in the second week. If you want to see the previous video on this ecosphere, there are links in the description as well as links to a channel called Life in Jars, which is where I got the idea and inspiration to try this. There's still quite a lot of activity going on in the jar, the most conspicuous of which being the flatworms which are still busy patrolling the inside surface of the glass. In this video we're going to see a couple of new organisms that I did not notice before, as well as new behaviours from the animals we saw last time. I worked a bit harder on some of the photography for this one. It's not all that easy because for one thing, the USB microscope I have is just not that great. But also, as with any microscope, the higher the magnification, the smaller the depth of field. So a lot of the time I would set the microscope up and record, only to find that the interesting action is happening just outside of the focal plane. Bear in mind, not all of the footage you see here is at the same level of magnification. I haven't quite worked out how to get a proper scale into these recordings. So checking in down at the sediment level, we can see activity from small crustaceans, copepods and daphnia. There seem to be fewer of them and they're generally less active, but I think a lot of that's because they've switched from feeding on suspended particles to grazing on algae and other foods coating the plants and pieces of detritus and the inside wall of the glass. I did get some interesting footage of one of the larger flatworms, although large is a relative term here, it's about 12 millimeters long moving comparatively fast and roving across the same small area again and again. Perhaps it sensed some food or prey here and is trying to get it. The hydras have done extremely well and they're both large and abundant in several places in the jar. Their success may well account for the slight decline in the population of the small crustaceans. Now you might think that after the first week of intently watching this small jar we would have seen all the life that there is to see in there, but there are a couple of new things. Firstly this worm, which I spotted only briefly and out of focus amongst the floating weed at the water surface. I quickly adjusted the focus and I was just lucky enough to get some fairly decent footage just before it moved out of frame. This is bigger than the swimming worm we saw last week. I suppose it's possible that this is the same one just grown up a bit, but to me it looks like it might be a different species. It seems to be much more flexible in its movements. I've not yet identified this animal, it's approximately two centimeters long, and if we freeze the video just at the right moment, we can see that it has a little tuft of bristles on its tail end. Another new thing I spotted was this small crustacean. At first I took it just to be another Daphnia, grazing on a piece of plant material. But when it moves we can just about make out it has legs and a sort of arched shape to its body. I think this is a freshwater shrimp. At maximum magnification I can also see microorganisms moving on the inside surface of the glass. It was initially difficult to figure out the level of magnification here and whether these things might be single-celled organisms or small crustaceans, or the larvae of larger crustaceans. One of the smaller flatworms helped me out there by photobombing the shot. Quickly peering around the camera, I was able to see this small grey flatworm with the naked eye, and I would estimate its body length to be about four to five millimeters. So we can use that as a rough guide to set a scale on some of the other things in shot. So laying that scale alongside the small organisms, we can see that their size is a very small fraction of a millimeter, which I think confirms that at least some of these are unicellular life. In particular, this one here, I think, is a single-celled predatory organism. Not exactly sure, as I can't get any closer than this but the behaviour I'm seeing here is very consistent with the movement of predatory protists I've seen in videos on that other favourite channel of mine, Journey into the Microcosmos. 
But it isn't just new organisms I saw. I also observed a couple of interesting behaviours. Firstly, this quite violent episode between a flatworm and a hydra. Now, we saw these two characters meet last time, but on this occasion you can see the flatworm really did not enjoy this encounter. The hydra then demonstrated a repositioning behaviour, where it retracts all of its tentacles, then purposely flexes and shifts the orientation of its body to extend in a different direction. They actually all do this periodically, even without the flatworm encounter. I guess it probably just makes them a little more effective in their ambush predator role. Looking very closely at the hydras, I was able to get a better look at the tentacles, and here we can just about make out the stinging cells, called nematocysts, which are strung along the length of the tentacles. Also, notice these translucent structures on the upper body of the hydra. These are reproductive organs. Last week we saw these animals reproducing asexually by budding, but this one is getting ready to reproduce sexually. These jelly-like bumps will develop into testes and ovaries which will release sperm and eggs into the water, where fertilization will take place and the result will be a new hydra with the combined genes of its two parents. Unlike the budded offspring, which are just clones of the individual parent. And here's another newly observed behaviour. The flatworms, after they spend a little while scouting the inner walls of the jar, often rest up near the top, forming themselves into a nearly hemispherical blob. I don't know if this is because the oxygen level is higher up there by the green plants, or if it's to digest food, or maybe the flatworms just take in a rest. A few people asked whether I should open the jar to allow oxygen to enter. I haven't done that, and I don't want to, as the idea here is to create a fully sealed and self-sustaining ecosphere. In any case, it hopefully shouldn't be necessary. There's a thick layer of duckweed at the surface, and using natural light, these green plants should produce some oxygen as a waste product of photosynthesis. Not all of this oxygen will make it down to the very bottom of the jar by diffusion, but any time one side of the jar is slightly warmer than the other, convection will occur in the water, and this will help to distribute oxygen. So that's what happened in week two, and I thought that was quite interesting. I can't promise there'll be full weekly updates every single week on this little pond on my windowsill, but any time anything interesting or new happens, I will try to document it. I hope that was interesting, thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon.